And now for today's program, Alexander Barnes currently serves as the command historian for the Virginia National Guard. A native of Niagara Falls, New York, Al grew up in an Air Force family. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1974 and joined the Army National Guard in 1977. Retiring as a Virginia Army National Guard Chief Warrant Officer in 2004, in July 2015, after 30 years of service as an Army civilian, he retired from the U.S. Army at Fort Lee. Al is a great friend to the museum, having taught several classes here on the Army and National Guard during World War I. He's the author of several books on the World War I era, including In a Strange Land, The American Occupation of Germany, 1918 to 1923, Let's Go, History of the 29th Infantry Division, To Hell with the Kaiser, American, America Prepares for War, and Forgotten Soldiers of World War I, America's Immigrant Doughboys. His most recent book is Play Ball, Doughboys and Baseball During the Great War. There are copies available upstairs, and I'm absolutely certain he would be happy to sign them for you after the lecture. So please give a warm welcome to our friend, Al Barnes. I think I have to apologize first. I don't have any adult beverages. <laughs> so, now, if anybody's got any here, we can share them. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Al, as, as Andy said. Uh, you're probably wondering, Al, we just had the 100th anniversary of November 11th, the armistice. What are you doing here talking about World War I again? Well, it's important to remember the armistice only stopped the shooting, didn't end the war. Then the Treaty of Versailles, was a peace treaty, but guess what? The Americans didn't sign it. So we didn't actually declare peace with Germany until the 1920s. And so today we're gonna to talk about some of those aspects of, and how they affected baseball. But before I go any further, just a quick show of hands. How many here have a relative that was a doughboy? A pretty good number, yeah. So this is for you and for them. The problem with being a military historian and a baseball fan is that so much of the stuff that's been left to us from this period is really hard to, to understand and to read. And this is the view we get a lot of times of those guys, that they were very kind of black and white and not much going on. But luckily, with today's technology, we can dig deeper into a lot of these pictures and get a handle on them. So watch this. Look at that. Now we've got something going on here that's worthy of study. You can see, look, we've got one of the players, who, of the guy that's running to home, standing up. We've got their equipment lying in front of them. We've got a couple other guys paying a lot of attention. And one guy's actually running the lineup card for his team. And look closely at how a couple of them look to, like they have bandages on their heads. Bear with me on that. So we move down the line, and look what we got here. We've got a couple guys that are really into the game. Look at this guy. He's happy. This guy can't believe what he's seeing. <laughs> These guys have those strange white things on their head. And that's because there's a structural flaw in the Army's hat of the period. If you look at them, what's missing? There's no brim. So what are you going to do when the sun's in your eyes and you're trying to watch your team play ball? You make one out of cardboard. So all those white hats, the white stripes, are not bandages. They're cardboard brims for their hats. <laughs> now, and if you look carefully, look what we have here. This is really interesting. There's an Asian doughboy. Now, a lot of people don't realize that, that in the army of the period, there was a good number of Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, Siamese, uh, Filipino, doughboys that served in the regular units of the Army. And here, fortunately, we've actually been able to capture the face of one of them. So let's look a little further down the line. What do we have here? We've got the umpire. Now, in most cases, the umpires had to be YMCA guys, because, and we talked about this in one of the classes, there was no USO during this time period. There were seven support organizations that Pershing allowed to come to, to 
to France. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, the YMCA, Jewish War League, Knights of Columbus. And so the only people that the soldiers would actually trust to be the ump in one of their games would be either a YMCA guy or the chaplain. <laughs> Everybody else had an ax to grind. And they took this seriously. And you can see, I mean, these guys are paying close attention. They're watching what the ump's seeing. So now let's go back to the scene at the plate. Look at this. He's crossing the plate. He's obviously safe. Looks like maybe the third base coach in his excitement is running down the line with him, encouraging him, go faster, go faster. The catcher's done the right thing. He's dumped his mask. There's the bat from the previous hitter, and everybody is looking on to see what the ump's going to call. I'm hoping that in the next 40 minutes or so, I can take you into that time period and show you some more of these people and give you a little better feeling for what they were like and what they were up against. But first, who can name the first five players elected into the Hall of Fame? Well, normally, if you were a bunch of soldiers, we'd actually go through the process and I'd, we'd fight our way through it. But I'm going to cheat and give you the answers, so go along. The first five players elected to the Hall of Fame were Honus Wagner. Right. Everybody knows Honus. Babe Ruth. Hard to miss him. Walter Johnson, the big train, one of the greatest right-handers of all times. Ty, uh, Christy Mathewson, another great right-hander, considered one of the finest finesse pitchers in baseball. And Ty Cobb, pretty good class of ball players. I mean, I think that's easy to see why those five guys were in the first group. But what would you think if I told you that those two guys actually served in France together and were wounded in the same accident? Okay, before we can get to that, I got to take you back to the 1918, 1919 period. If you're trying to understand baseball, you've got to understand some of these terms for that period. Now, people in those days were not nearly as politically correct as we are today. <laughs> so that you can see, if you were a German American, you were almost automatically Dutch or Heine. <laughs> if you were Jewish, you became Mo. If you were a Native American, you were always chief. Uh, a young kid joining the team was almost always babe. If you wore glasses, you were specs. Yeah, how dare you wear glasses in the, in the game. If you were a country boy, you became rube. And that's why when you look at these rosters and go to the Hall of Fame, you see all these names. I mean, that, that was the deal. You joined the club, and, and if you were one of those, you got it. And what's even less politically correct, and there were a lot of deaf ball players. Every deaf ball player was automatically dummy. Yeah, not so pleasant, all of it. Uh, <laughs> If you were trying to read their box scores, most times they called a single a bingle. And they called an error a foozle or a fozzle. And if you were coming to play your biggest rival, you came to shake bats with them. So, now, what's even more confusing is you read through this time period where they had nicknames for their nicknames. <laughs> the Boston Americans. How the heck do you get the Boston Red Sox become the Boston Americans? Simple. They played in the American League. There were two teams in Boston, the Boston Braves and the Boston Red Sox. So the Boston Red Sox became the Boston Americans at times. There were also, you'd have the Boston Nationals for the Braves. The Brooklyn Robins, they didn't have two teams, but they had a, uh, a manager named uh, Wilbur Robinson, so they started calling them the Brooklyn Robins. At times, the Cleveland Indians became the Cleveland Naps for Nap LaJoy, their manager. So, as you go through this, so you, you've got to have a translator. Uh, the Johnson League. How the heck do you get the Johnson League out of the American League? Simple. It was uh, created by a man named uh, Ban Johnson. So a lot of times we refer to the Johnson League. Down here, the New York Nationals obviously were the New York Giants. So here's your chance to translate. After all that, that verbiage, what Huey's really saying is he thinks the Yankees will win the pennant. <laughs> right? That was an easy one. Here's, a, here's where the class gets harder. Here's you're starting to mix doughboy slang with baseball slang. You can see New York is having a little trouble on and on. Well, the deal is Dutch, Leonard, doesn't want to sign his contract. He doesn't think they're offering him enough money. So finally, he signs with Detroit. And what happens is that 
after the war, Dutch ends up working for a player manager, a guy named Ty Cobb. And he and Ty Cobb hate each other. They fight all the time until finally Dutch quits, goes back to California to his big farm where he was a grape vineyard owner. He was a raisin grower. See how they turn that around on? So he goes back to California. And then when all the, uh, the Japanese Americans lost their farms because of uh, being interred during the Second World War, Dutch took over and ran their farms for them using his folks. And when they came back from the internment camps, turned the farms back over to him, along with all the profits he'd made in their absence. So Dutch was a pretty decent guy. But uh, as the Doughboy said, you know, Dutch better put his name on the contract because his holdup days are finny. <laughs> all right, that's enough introduction. Let's get to it. Play ball is because before the war, there were two kinds of men in America, professional ball players and guys that wanted to be professional ball players. <laughs> And the Army understood this early. The Army figured out that how do you keep troops out of trouble? Is you have them play as many sports as you can. And so here's a team from Hawaii before the war. And you can see they've got pretty fancy uniforms. They're Company K of whatever regiment this is. They've stacked their bats just like they'd stack their rifles. They've put their gloves on top. And almost like a religious offering is a brand new baseball in a box. I mean, what could be more significant than that? Now, here's where it starts to get really interesting. Remember, we, we're guarding a long border with Mexico. And there's a lot of downtime on your hands if you're in these small outposts along the Mexican, Texas, Arizona, New Mexican border. And so what do they do? They play a lot of baseball. And you can see in this picture is interesting for a couple things. This is the lieutenant from one of the troops. And you can see that has got to be the most closed stance ever. Now, if you understand baseball, an open stance is when you face as much as you can the, the pitcher. Closed stance is when you face away. He's about as closed as you can get. There's the only place he can hit that ball is to left field. But what's more interesting, he's still wearing his spurs. <laughs> so, so maybe Ty Cobb could learn a few lessons about sliding from a guy wearing spurs. Now, here's a group of guys that are from C Troop of the 13th Cavalry. And the reason they're so happy is they've just come back from chasing Pancho Villa for 500 miles into Mexico. And now they get to play baseball. And you can see, like everybody else, they very carefully arrayed their gear so that you can see that they have all the right stuff. And if you look at the numbers, you can see there's only nine ball players. You've got two coaches and nine ball players. So that's pretty much the standard for these guys. If you see 10, 11, 12, 13 ball players, it's a much bigger unit. So how did we get to all this? Uh, when war broke out in 1917, uh, the American Army had a, a little over 100,000 soldiers. It also had 110,000 National Guardsmen. So we got 200 and something thousand men to put into France to fight in the war. But we need a much bigger army. Because you can see, by the end of the war, we got 2 million men, most of them sitting in camps on the East Coast, getting ready to go to France. Because the plan is for a big offensive at the end of to end the war is in the spring of 1919. That armistice in November of 18 caught them all by surprise. So these guys were all planning to go to France to fight. Plus, the plan was to go draft 2 million more. Now, over in France at that time, we've already got 2 million men. It's pretty impressive numbers. And then we also have men in Siberia, northern Russia, the Philippines, China, the Mexican border, and another 800,000 serving in the Marine Corps and the Navy. So this, in 17 months, we go from 200,000 to these huge numbers. How do you do that? Easy. You draft them. Uh, and the only way to make the draft work is to make it universal, because the North tried to draft during the Civil War, and it was a fiasco. What they've said is everybody will register. And you can see I, I, I kind of highlighted this. Aliens must register as well as citizens, blacks as well as whites, the lame, the blind, the sick, the well, <laughs> civil government, ministers, farmers, merchants, bankers, lawyers, doctors, everybody. It makes no condition what a man's race, color, or creed, or profession, or physical condition. That's pretty important. My grandfather was, only had one eye and was missing a couple fingers from a mining accident. He had to go down and register for the draft with his brother. So everybody, everybody from 21 to 31, all men, regardless if you're within the confines of the United States or its territories, you have to register on the 6th of June. 
Now look, the guy setting the type for this was so excited by this news, <laughs> he actually got it upside down. So you, you, know, you can be overly excited by the draft. So the bottom line is everybody 21 to 31, regardless of who you are, if you're a man, you're gonna register. Now what makes that a little more interesting, if you think about it, every time you see all these pictures of ladies serving in France and all these organizations as nurses, as telephone operators, keep in mind that they're all volunteers. Every single one of them is a volunteer, whereas the men didn't have that choice. So what happens when you register for the draft? You go in, you sign up, you get issued a number. If you're the 13th guy through the door that morning, you get number 13. If you're the 128th guy, you get 128. Pretty straightforward, until the board went all the way around the room and back to 10,500, because they figured that was the highest number of men any one draft board could handle for this conscription. So what happens is they take all those numbers and they put them in little gelatin capsules and put them into a fishbowl, and then they blindfold the Secretary of War, and he has to reach in and draw out the first number. And if he draws out the number 162, every guy who was 162 at his draft board has now been selected for the Army. Pretty simple process. You know, in my era, we, it all went based on your birthday. They put the, all the birthdays in and then, uh, surprise, you win. Well, these guys had all the way out to 10, 500. Uh, an interesting part of the story is that when they, they filled all these gelatin capsules with 10,500 little pieces of paper, one of them dropped on the floor that nobody noticed. And one of the ladies that was helping do this work actually stepped on it and carried it home in the heel of her shoe. She got home, took her shoes off, and realized her having that one number has just negated the validity of the entire draft. So she had to take a cab back to the office and get that number back into the bowl. And here's what those numbers look like. This is from the first draft, and you can see, I mean, they've thought this through. There's a line, so nobody can make a mistake thinking that 908 is really 806, or 81, 89 is the opposite. So, I mean, that's how much effort they put into this. So now we got them drafted. We got all these guys ready to go be soldiers. What do we do with them? Well, we're gonna build 32 very large training camps, mainly on the East Coast because we're going to take them across the ocean, this direction, to France. But they still have some across the rest of the country. And if you look and see, there's two different kinds of dots showing up here. You got the black ones that are for the draftees and the, the clear ones that are for the National Guard. Now, why would a National Guard camp be different from a draftee camp? Simple. Most of the National Guard guys have already been in uniform. They've been trained. They, they actually know a little bit about what they're planning on doing. The draftees are going to have to be taught from scratch. Everything's going to have to start from scratch with them. And when they started building the camps, they also quickly realized they only had enough money to build half of the camps. So what they did was they built the draftee camps, and the National Guard units were told, take your tents down south, and you'll live in tents for your training period. And that was a good plan. It saved a lot of money, but that was also the, the coldest winter in the history of the South in like 50 years. And so a lot of these guys spent most of their time uh, you know, trying to stay warm rather than focusing on their, on their duties. One other thing that that's, we'll talk real quickly is there's a common theme running around that every one of the camps south of the Mason-Dixon were named for southern officers, and all the ones north were named for northern officers. Not hardly. Take a look at Texas. Texas has one name for a Michigan general and an Illinois general and two guys who fought at the Alamo. Pike is for Zebulon Pike, the guy who discovered Pike's Peak. Uh, McClellan certainly was not from Alabama, <laughs> nor was Sheridan, nor was Hancock, nor was Wadsworth. Those are all famous Union generals. There are a couple that are Confederate, Lee, uh, Gordon, Wheeler, and Beauregard. The point being, when a camp was built, it was going to be named by the Army for one of two things someone of significance to that region, President Andrew Jackson, or where the troops that were gonna be trained there were coming from. So that's why the Virginia National Guard went to Camp McClellan, because in the division that was being created for them, 
there were more people from New Jersey than there were from Virginia and Maryland. So that's why they chose that name. So. And this is what the camps looked like. They were huge cities. Very quickly, most of these camps became one of the top two or three cities in a state. You can see they're endless. They just go on and on forever. And you're training up to 50,000 guys at a time and living in these, in these buildings. And you'll notice that the, every building is exactly the same. You see the little side building, side building. It was like an erector set. They got instructions. This building will be this long, and they would get kits saying, here's all the screws. It's like putting IKEA furniture together. <laughs> so it was everything you needed to build a camp. The Marines were doing the same thing up at Quantico and down at Paris Island. Now, here's a couple of Marine players from Quantico. And what's interesting here is, take a look here if you can see. There's a belt loop at the front of his trousers, and he's got the buckle pushed to the side. I've never had, gotten an explanation of why you would do that. And he wasn't alone. If you look at this Virginia National Guardsman at Camp McClellan, he's got the exact same thing. Belt loop right down the middle and, and buckle on the side. Just one more mystery. Uh, this guy is kind of an impressive Virginia National Guardsman. He uh, started the war as a corporal, ended it as a, as a captain. Uh, then in World War II came along, he rejoined the Army again and made it to major, and then finally got promoted to warrant officer, which was a great step above being a captain or a major. Whenever Pete and I, my co-writer, uh, talked about this picture, he, Pete's an Air Force guy, so he always said, this is just a typical example <laughs> of the Army ruining fun. <laughs> and, and I said, Pete, that's too simplistic. You're, that's too Air Force. What, what's really going on here is we don't know where the plate is, we don't know where the ball is. The ump is already calling him safe. <laughs> They're wearing their gas masks to train in them. But the best part is this YMCA lady who's going, what the heck are they doing this time? <laughs> uh, so, so that's the Marine Corps perspective versus the, uh, the Air Force perspective. And if you go down the road, just not far from here, it was beautiful Camp Lee. And Camp Lee was huge and one of the biggest of the training camps. And you can see the kind of crowd they're drawing just for a pickup ball game. So now we're going to switch over. We're going to go from baseball players, or from soldiers <laughs> playing baseball to the other side of the coin, baseball players trying to play soldier. Uh, you can imagine, we're, we're drafting thousands and thousands of husbands, brothers, sons, cousins, nephews to join the Army. And people going out to the ballpark are saying, why aren't those guys in uniform? Those are the healthiest athletes we've got. They're superb athletes. They should be the ones in uniform. And what's not helping the cause is that college football, which is big at the time, there was no professional football, whole teams of college students are enlisting together. So you got these baseball players and the boxers, who are the other professional athletes that aren't putting forward much effort. So what does the owner of the New York Yankees do? These two gentlemen. They bring in a sergeant, and he teaches the ball players how to march in formation using a bat instead of a rifle. And all the teams start doing this. And so pretty soon, you've got them putting on close order drills with, with their baseball equipment. Yeah, nice try. The, uh, probably the most important thing here is this sergeant must be one heck of a drill instructor. Because if you notice, including the officer, the two owners, and all of us, they're all in step. I mean, now they tell me that's not hard. So then you got Germany Schaefer, all right? So he didn't even get to be Dutch or Heine. He had to be Germany Schaefer because his first name was Herman. And, and Germany Schaefer, is a, is a, he's kind of a visionary. Uh, he's the guy, if, if you know baseball and you like baseball, uh, it's because of him that there's a specific rule in baseball. Germany was on first base. One of his teammates was on third. And the manager flashed the signal for the double steal. So the pitcher throws the ball to the plate. Germany takes off. Slides into second, safe. The guy on third never left. He, he missed the sign. So now Germany's on second. The pitcher's getting ready to throw again. Throws the ball. Germany runs back to first base. <laughs> the, everybody, the fans erupt. The umpire. Nobody ever thought to put a rule saying that once you've established yourself on a base, you can't go backwards again. <laughs> so, so thanks to Germany, that rule is now on the books. On the next pitch, Germany steals back, goes back to second base, 
and the guy in third comes home and they win the game. But the important thing was, because of Germany, we have this, this rule about not going backwards. <laughs> so what kind of, what do you think Germany's reaction is now that his country is at war with Germany? Well, he changes his name. <laughs> he is now going to be Liberty Schaefer. Sadly, uh, Liberty Schaefer didn't live very long. He uh, got caught in the Spanish flu in 1918 and passed shortly thereafter. But, but we still remember him for these great accomplishments. So we got all these guys in service, and now you got these baseball players, and what are they going to do? Well, the Secretary of War is going to fix the situation. You're either going to go work in a defense industry, or you're going in the Army or Navy. And you got till 1 September to make up your mind. And a lot of the ball players immediately chose defense industry. And that's why you see so many of them playing for industrial league teams and shipyard teams. Uh, you know, that was what some of them did. The rest were pretty straightforward guys. And so they, uh, they actually did the right thing. Here's a, a Canadian immigrant, J.J. Clark, who is catcher for the Cleveland Indians. And before he even has to, he enlists in the Marine Corps. And here he is again with a Marine Corps baseball team that he was coaching and playing on with another guy from the St. Louis Cardinals, an uh, infielder named Dots Miller. And so the two of these guys didn't wait to be drafted. They went and joined, and they, and they built this powerhouse team before they eventually went to France. And, and they're both kind of unique individuals because the Marine drill instructors were fascinated by Miller because he seemed to have the most incredible eyesight they'd ever seen. So he was... He scored all the highest ratings on the rifle range. J.J. Uh, Clark, he's really different. He goes to France, serves during the war, comes back home, goes back into baseball, says, I don't like this anymore, rejoins the Marine Corps. <laughs> so, so he obviously got it right. <laughs> now, these guys are trying to get it right. They're uh, the people writing songs. They're trying to show patriotism and why baseball is doing all this work for the, for the uh, Army and the Navy. If you ever get a chance to read any of these songs, they're awful. There's a reason, <laughs> there's a reason we don't sing Bobby the Bomber anymore or batter up <laughs> Uncle Sam or playing baseball. There's a reason. So just put that in the back of your mind. That, eh, much better songs in World War II than there were in World War I. So we got all these guys training. We got baseball players becoming uh, soldiers and vice versa. Well, in June of 1917, we're trying to push as many folks over to France as we can. We've got to build a presence over there because right now the Germans are winning the war. And so, but they never forget to take their gear with them. And you can see here's from an aviation squadron. Here's the team. And they're going to play in their uniforms, but it looks like somebody's managed to get them some tennis shoes. So. Now, here's from the, the Doughboys paper. The World Series opened in February. What they're saying here is now American soldiers are actually fighting. And if you think the outfield is a creeping in to catch the Kaiser's pop, and here's a South Paul twirler with a lot of vim and hop, if you think those are bad lyrics, these are actually better than the ones that were in those other songs. <laughs> but, so there's a, but there's a lot of iconic stuff about why baseball prepares guys to be better soldiers. Now, what is one thing soldiers like to do when they get overseas? They like to have their pictures taken to show how tough they are. Send these back to the home folks and say, look, uh, you know, I'm out here doing the important work for the Lord. I've got a pistol, and I'm smoking, and I'm tough. I prefer this guy. He sends home his portrait with a baseball bat, showing it. I haven't forgotten. I still know how to play. Now, here's an interesting guy who's... Uh, he played for the Boston Red Sox, was a key part of their, uh, their two championships in 15 and 16. He gets drafted in the Army, gets sent to France, where he has the unusual experience of being traded to the senators while he's actually in the Army. <laughs> you know, how would you like to wake up, read the Stars and Stripes in the Muse Argonne and find out you're now play for Washington instead of Boston? So. The guns stopped shooting in, in November 11th. Uh, now we've got all these guys that they, we don't have to make them go to the rifle range. We don't have to make them attack. We, we're trying to get them healthy. What do we do with them? 
you let them play baseball. Here's the Virginia National Guard uh, artillery unit playing against an all-star team from the division headquarters. So there were, and I, I made a note of this, and I don't usually go big on numbers, but after the armistice, they started tournaments in France and in, uh, and in uh, Belgium, 55,000 ballplayers on 3,700 teams. That's how many unit teams there were. Everybody was playing baseball. Everybody, you gotta keep them busy, keep them out of trouble till you get them on the ships to send them home. Now, we can't forget that we had Canadian neighbors on our continent, and they liked baseball. Baseball was a big sport in Canada back in that time period, too. And you can see, here's the Canadian Army playing ball, and they brought out their YMCA guy, because they don't trust anybody else either. Be the... Now, what's interesting is the few times that the Americans go play the Canadians and the Americans win, it gets put in the paper the next day. Americans win the real World Series. So. And here's even downtown Paris. They've turned one of the parks into a ball field, and they're playing ball. And you can see the French are going, what the heck is this? They're all lying. You know, doesn't look like a real game to them. Now, back, we got the armistice, and on 11 November, we're going to send a quarter of a million, a quarter of a million soldiers to Germany to guard the, uh, the Rhine River to make sure Germans can't come back and attack again. So what do you think the soldiers do almost immediately after getting to Germany? They start laying out baseball diamonds. They've got it going, and the Germans, you think the French are confused by it. This is a doughboy cartoon, but the Germans never got a handle on what the heck are these guys doing out there? And you can see this, this is the second division uh, in there. They've actually built a pretty fancy stadium with a scoreboard, and here is a fascinating 20 to 1 game going on in the, you know, the top of the fifth. And you can see how excited these guys are to, to be watching this game. <laughs> Even the little kid is going, I, I don't understand what's going on here. But, but you can see, again, you've got the cardboard brims. If, you, uh, if you've ever been to Germany, if you know Germany at all, the Rhine River and the Mosul Rivers come together at Koblenz, where the American headquarters was. And usually on one side of the river will be, mount, be mountainous and where they, all the grape fields are, the grape vineyards, and the other side is pretty flat. So these are guys from the 4th Division and taking advantage of this flatness. The river is probably right down there, so they had to be careful not to hit the ball into the river. But you can see there's an actual action shot from the 4th Division playing baseball in Germany in 1918. Now there's a lot going on in this picture. There's a lot of things that somebody's got some explaining to do. Uh, the n top number one souvenir for every doughboy was a German pickle halva. You know, the helmets with the spike on the top? That was the favorite souvenir. They all wanted one. And so one of these guys has got one. And you can see that they're actually at, a, at somebody's house. Because when you move a quarter million soldiers into an area that doesn't have barracks, and it's winter, you billet them in private homes. So they would march into the town where they're going to be staying, and 10 guys would be sent to that farm, six would go to this house, three would go here, and so the unit would be portioned out to all the houses in the town. So you can see these guys, this is some of the guys from the big red one. They are uh, sitting in front of their house that they're staying in, and this guy has got himself a, you know, a unauthorized web belt. He's gotten rid of that, and these are German buttons from their uniforms, another big souvenir. Get a belt, put German buttons on it, goes along with the, it's probably his helmet. The kids are, are obviously enamored of the GIs. Why? Because for the first time in four years, there's chocolate, there's canned fruit, there's all sorts of sweets. And soldiers being soldiers, most of them can't eat all the food they get, so they share it with the locals. And so these kids have kind of obviously adopted it. And in return, you can see, they're trying to teach them baseball. <laughs> uh, see, look, he's got his first base glove, he's got an outfielder's glove. He's hurt his hand somehow, and these kids are obviously saying, okay, this is a great game, when do we eat? <laughs> the, the sad, poignant part about this is that these guys are probably five or six years old, is knowing that in 20 years, you know, they're going to be in German Army uniforms, probably fighting against the children of these soldiers, so friendships don't always last. Now, I wish I could prove this without a doubt. We all know the movie A League of Their Own. 
I think the people that pioneered that American Girls Professional Baseball League were these ladies. In 1920, the American nurses in Germany thought that they were pretty good ball players. And so they got their team together and they were going to take on the YMCA ladies. <laughs> and it was going to be a big game between the two. And here's an actual picture from the game. And you can see, I think the nurses had an unfair advantage. I mean, they're wearing these bloomers or pantaloons, and the YMCA ladies are wearing those full coats with all that stuff. But after the game ended, it was 20 to 12, nurses won. And there were over 8,000 people watching the game. I mean, that's an amazing thing. So I, if they weren't the reason we had the Professional Girls League, I think at least they were pioneers and should be mentioned. Well, we're on the baseball theme. How about a field of dreams? We all know the field of dreams. Uh, one of the most poignant characters is the, the guy, uh, Moonlight Graham, who only got one at bat in the base, baseball uh, during his career. Now, let's take a look at this picture. This is from that same series I showed you earlier. See, it's still the same ump. Only this time, the guys in the dark uniform are scoring the run, and the guys in the light uniform is the catcher. There's his mask. Here's the guy picking up the bat so make sure nobody trips over it. Well, let's look a little closer. If you look a little closer, you can see the numbers, 310, because he played for the 310th Motor Transportation Repair Unit. These guys were, were truly the cream of the crop in baseball in, in Germany in 1918, 1919, and they won the championship. But what's more important, and it's hard to see his face, and that's all we got of him, but his name was Paul Sparrow from Anvil, Pennsylvania. And in 1920, he made it to the big leagues for one game. He got two at-bats, didn't hit anything, and never played again. So, so there's a true life moonlight ground for you. His name was Paul Sparrow. And of course, with a last name like Sparrow, what's his nickname going to be? Birdie. Yes. <laughs> See, you just got to understand their lexicon. Here's a little bit more interesting guy. Uh, this guy, Arthur Forrest, played in the Midwest. He was drafted, and in the Meuse Argonne received the Medal of Honor. I mean, that's quite an accomplishment. Even in those days, it was a, to, to win the Medal of Honor in the Meuse Argonne, leading his squad forward. Uh, and then he gets out of the Army, and what does he do? He goes back to playing minor, oops, back to playing minor league baseball for 10 more years. I can't imagine. A, how do you strike out or throw out of a game a Medal of Honor recipient. I, I, you know, but, but you got to give it to him. He tried. He tried. But there was a price for all that, for all that fun and games and, and sportsmanship. Uh, Captain Eddie Grant. Eddie Grant had been to, played in the majors for 10 years, a heck of a ball player. He also was a lawyer. Uh, he quit baseball just before the war started to open up his law firm. And when the war uh, was declared, Eddie immediately signed up and became a captain in the uh, 77th Division. And he was killed in the Meuse Argonne uh, trying to rescue the Lost Battalion. He was leading his, his company forward when they were caught by an artillery barrage, and Eddie was killed. Uh, same thing, uh, Bun Troy was a pitcher, German-born pitcher, uh, playing for the Detroit Tigers, and he was killed in the Meuse Argonne. Uh, Meuse Argonne, there are a lot of ball players, major league, ne Negro league, minor league, guys that were killed in the Meuse Argonne. And then here's Christy Mathewson and Ty Cobb. And both of them were in the Army Chemical Corps. And they were both captains. And what happened was they were training troops in how to put on their gas mask to prepare for attacks in the Argonne. And they didn't know that the gas had already been released. And so five or six soldiers died. Mathewson, uh, he, he was badly affected by the gas so that he died the year after the war ended most likely from the long-term effects of the gas. Uh, and Cobb, bless him, he, his, he survived. He, uh, he came through OK and, and ended up going back to the major leagues and having a, a further great career. But they're both wounded in the same, uh, same bad accident. Perhaps the saddest of all is uh, Calvin Bryant. He's a full-blooded Choctaw Indian who was a heck of a ball player, as enlisted in the Army. He was a volunteer in the 90th Division. He was killed one hour before the end of the war. So, yeah, Meuse Argonne was a terrible place. 
Here's just some other names real quick to throw out at you. So it wasn't just those guys that were famous. You can look at the names. Casey Stengel, Harry Hellman, Branch Rickey, the guy that integrated baseball, serving in France as a chemical officer. Grover Cleveland Alexander. Uh, you know, he's the only guy named for a president who was also played in the movies by a president. Ronald Reagan played Grover Cleveland Alexander <laughs> in, in a movie called The Winning Team. So that was, but Grover, he's also a poster boy for PTSD. He, he had a tough time in the Argonne. Uh, Eddie Plank, Gettysburg Eddie, George Sisler, 400 hitter, Johnny Evers. He was too old for the Army, so he went over there with the YMCA. So he was one of the guys handing out prizes and teaching the guys how to play ball. And of course, the most important for us here in Virginia, Epa Rixey. Epa from Culpeper, Virginia, never played it, an inning in the minor league, went right from, <laughs> from the major league into, uh, from, the, from college into the major league, where for many years, he held the record for the most wins by a left-handed pitcher. He also holds the record for the most losses by a left-handed pitcher. <laughs> now, now, Epa was an interesting guy because you could always tell the day, the afternoon after he had pitched, when you walk into the locker room, if everything was broken, you knew Epa had pitched that day and lost. If everything, if, you know, if the water jugs were still in good shape, if all the, the benches were in the right place, Epa had won. So he had a terrible temper. And yet, when he'd go home in the off season, he spent his time teaching Latin to high school kids. I can't imagine anything more aggravating than teaching Latin to anybody, <laughs> but, but Epa, Epa could do that. And again, and he is the only guy who was elected to the Hall of Fame and died before his induction. Before that, we've had guys that died and then got elected or died after they were elected and inducted. He's the only one who died in between being elected and his induction. And so the beat goes on today. Uh, Here's this picture again of our Canadian brothers. Here's a picture of the Virginia National Guard in, in Afghanistan. Almost identical swings. If you look, head down, looking, eyes up. Another typical guard picture from the training camps. You can see they've got all their gear laid out in front, got their gloves. Virginia National Guard in Iraq, 2007. And finally, this is my friend, oops, that's my friend Chuck. Chuck got over to Iraq in 2008 and he sent me a note that said, Al, I'm working with these Iraqi guys and they all have red hats. Can you get me something? And I think he wanted a beret. <laughs> but a Richmond Braves hat was the perfect answer. So, so he wore it. And that's it. I, if you have any questions, I, I'll take your questions or your comments. No, they're pretty much, pretty much the same. Uh, and, and that's what makes baseball so fascinating. You know, every football field is exactly the same. 100 yards by 60 yards. Hockey rinks are all the same size. Basketball is the same like. But every baseball field is different, yet it has these really strict rules about how you play. So, so that's why it makes the perfect American game, because we all like rules. We also like to wing it. And that's why you get Fenway Stadium that has a weird left field and Yankee Stadium, which has a weird right field. So, but the basic rules, three strikes, you're out, four balls, you're, you're on base. You didn't mention the name Hank Gowdy. Uh, <laughs> am I correct that he was the first major leaguer to volunteer for the service? You're right. Hank is a, is a heck of a guy. Uh, only based on time alone is the only reason I didn't talk about Gowdy, because he's another one who was considered a great ball player because of his one great World Series. He went to France and he was a heck of a soldier. I mean, this guy was considered one of the top officers in his unit and led him all the way through the war and then went back. He never could recreate that, that greatness in his baseball career. But if you go to Fort Benning today, the baseball field is still named for Hank Gowdy. So he was a heck of a guy. I'm showing my ignorance here, but why were they called Doughboys? <laughs> Man, that, that's a $64,000 question. I like to think it's because of during the time they were, uh, they were chasing Pancho Villa. And if you've been into the Mexican desert in Sonora, 
it's real powdery. It's real powdery sand, not like the stuff you get in Saudi Arabia or Iraq or Kuwait or these other places. So that when the troops would come back in from their training marches or, or patrols, they'd be all coated in white. And, and other people think it's because they lived in built adobe houses and so that. But but the most common I've seen is because of this white white powdery sand. You mentioned that one soldier died, one player died with the, during the great flu pandemic. Did the great flu pandemic affect baseball in general? Very much. Yeah. Very much. Uh, fortunately, if you remember, the worst part of the flu pandemic was late September, October, November, December of 1918. Uh, Secretary War Newton stopped the season at 1 September. So he, uh, so luckily there weren't crowds there. But in other places, you know, they, they canceled the Chesterfield County Fair. It, it was so bad on the east coast of the United States. So there was some real effect of, of these guys. Uh, with your interest in baseball and that particular time period, are you a collector? Do you have artifacts, memorabilia from that era? Not really, because uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. My heroes were Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, Tom Tresh, and I collected their stuff. I used to write to those guys, and they would, act, in those days, they would actually write back and send you stuff before it became a big business. But no, I, I, man, I would love to have some of this stuff, but I think it's, you know, the prices would be ridiculous. Hi. The, uh, today, when you watch baseball, they have speed clocks, a 92, 95 mile an hour fastball. Is there any technology that can really accurately measure how fast? Christy Matthews and guys like that threw the ball? Man, that, that's a great question, too. You know, I, I have you seen the film They Shall Not Grow Old about the British Army and how they took all the film footage of the period and speeded it up and slowed it down to put it in real time? So if you had footage like that of, of Christy Matthewson, you might be able, or Walter Johnson, you might be able to get some kind of a, of a real feel for what the speed was. But, but again, it's all relative. I, I still think it's amazing that the bases are the same distance apart now as they were back then. When you think about how fast athletes are nowadays and how much speed is in the game, you think, man, they'd have to spread the, and it's still the same percentage of guys get caught stealing, you know, or as steals as they did back in the 20s. So obviously, whoever laid out the first diamond got it right. One more. Uh, I don't know how far back your research went, but I remember reading Nathaniel Philbrick's book about Custer's Last Stand, and I think a lot of those cavalry units had baseball teams for the same reason that you talked about, and I don't remember who they were, but you may have come across this in your research, but there were a number of very good ball players, professional ball players, that were killed at Little Bighorn. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know it. I, 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 I was fascinated to find out that the guy who, uh, who was actually commanding the 7th Cavalry Regiment before the Little Bighorn was back on the East Coast recruiting when Custer took them out to their demise. And his last name was Sturgis, and the town of Sturgis is named for him, which I was like, why? Well, he, he sent the only record of being uh, captured by the Mexicans in the Mexican-American War and then captured by the Confederates in the Civil War. And, and, but he got a team, town named after him, so and, uh, otherwise I can't help you with that question. Thanks a lot, Al. Thank you. Thank you.